Hi. Welcome to Mr. Murder Fix. I'm Lucas Brand, and I'd like to personally thank you for listening. This is a big episode. Monumental. The first of many to come. We're still working out some of the kinks, so bear with us. However, I can promise you that we are and will be dedicated to creating quality content for the extended foreseeable future. This will include adding bonus episodes through our Patreon that will be more personal experiences for our supporters. We're also toying with the idea of having additional shows under a similar moniker that deal with other subject matter entirely. In the meantime, please feel free to join us on social media by clicking the links in the episode description. You'll be among the first founders of what John and I envision to be an awesome online community. You also get the latest updates, pictures, and videos we post. Oh, one more thing. Please take the time to rate this podcast and leave a review. It is extremely important to us to hear your feedback and actually really helps to boost our exposure to potential listeners on all platforms. For those of you who enjoy the show and would like to see us grow, take a moment to do so if you can. And once again, thanks for being here with us and welcome. We are now live. You're listening to Mr. Murder Fix, starring Lucas Brand and John Nye. Enjoy the ride. This program contains graphic imagery and depictions of violence, not suitable for children, mature audiences only. start this dude are we recording We're, i mean are we let's do it let's do it okay so welcome to mr murder fix between the year 1902 and 1906 in the city of laporte indiana a series of events would unfold that would end with the shocking discovery of between 24 and 40 dismembered bodies on a local farm owned by a rather large in stature and unsavory individual by the name of bell ganess also known to her neighbors and victims' family members as Hell's Princess, Lady Bluebeard, and the Butcher of Men. Hmm. And, yeah, she, she was a big, nasty lady. Sounds like it. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip through some stuff. Okay. Um, so basically, it all kind of starts in the, the Chicago fire time, right? So in 1871, Chicago, this is the Chicago fire, boom. Destroyed the city, um, wrecked a bunch of stuff. I mean, it was a huge fire. You know, people lost their homes. They were homeless, whatever. Um, A lot of Norwegian immigrants came in at this time, um, including like Bella's sister had migrated from Norway and stuff like that. Okay. Um, In Bella's early life, uh, not a lot is known as factual, but there is a lot of hearsay. So, and and some of those things, like I'll just touch on, um, she she worked from a very young age to to try and provide for the family. They were not rich people by any means. in their little Norwegian village. Hmm. Um, she worked <clears throat> on neighbors' farms, uh, milking, herding cattle, stuff like that. And uh, she seemed, by all accounts, to be a pretty nice young girl. Normal. You know, pretty normal. Okay. Um, and as she kind of grew into her teenage years, some things happened that kind of tipped the scales the other way. Uh, okay. One of those things is that she got pregnant out of wedlock. <clears throat> no, no, in those times. Yeah. Big no no, um, and I mean usually if that happens, like you're pretty much got you got to get married, mm. right? Well, the gentleman that impregnated her uh, did not want to do that. So there's a couple different stories. Like one of them is kind of like he invited her to a dance or whatever, and then he beat the crap out of her and basically kicked her in the stomach, and you know she miscarried. Another one is like he you know lured her into a private area. I've heard different you know renditions of this, but the main thing is you know she went through some trauma. Mm. You know, and that's a consistent story. Okay. So uh, a lot of people repeated that and said that about, you know, what happened. Um, Which is consistent with somebody that ends up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> if you're a little kid and stuff like that happens to you, man, or a teenager or whatever, I mean, that's a traumatic event that would definitely change your outlook on life for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, at, the, at the very least. So, <clears throat> I mean, shortly thereafter, she saved up. Um, 
some meager earnings. She started working for a larger uh, farm and getting paid. Um, and she decided she was going to save up her money and she was going to move to America. Um, like I said before, her sister had already kind of moved there. Um, and a lot of Norwegians were doing this at this time, moving to the Midwest. And, you know, that was kind of like, you know, the American first dream. migration. Yeah, the American dream. Yeah. So her sister actually helped pay uh, in the end for her to move to America. Um, her sister lived in Chicago. Uh, she got married. And uh, she had a little small family. Um, I think she had two daughters, maybe three. Um, so she offered to pay uh, Bella's fare to come to America, right? Mm -hmm. um, so she came over on uh, these steamships they had at the time, and it was kind of a sickening journey, right? A lot of people were throwing up. Like the way they advertised it was like some really big special thing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like it's totally cool. Everything's clean. You're going to be served. Like the cabins are perfect. And it was not that at all. So what, um, what year are we touching on? Uh, we're talking right now. It's probably 1890. She was born in 1859 and right here, 1881. 1881. Okay. So I'm sure there was a lot of promises, but it's gotta be pretty dirty. Yeah, it was it was a gross situation, dude. Like, right, people were sleeping on shelves and and like, Ugh. yeah, it was yeah. on top yeah. of each other, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a lot of talk of like puke, and the food was disgusting. It was like inedible. Um, a lot of the people had to like toss it overboard, and this was like a week long journey. I mean, before it would take like a month or something, like uh -huh. on a schooner or a sail ship. Okay. Uh, so there was that you know advantage to that, but still, it was definitely a a horrible ride. Um. <clears throat> Shortly after her arrival to Chicago, uh, Bella began work as a domestic servant. Um, this was normally a job reserved for indentured servants and house slaves before and during the Civil War. However, it provided Bella with just enough to get by for the time being. Uh, she basically gave all her money to her sister uh, mm -hmm. to kind of pay for room and board and, and et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was uh, Bella's dream to, you know, have money. You know, she wanted to live the American dream. She yeah. wanted to get sucked into all that, you know, and, and Chicago had become a pretty booming place since the events of the Chicago fire. They built back like crazy uh, department stores were huge and, and there was a lot to look at and a lot of stuff to. This is the place to be if you're going to start trying to do something. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot to like. A lot of places to shop around, a lot of things to look at, a lot of pretty things to want. And Bella was totally sucked in by all that stuff. Um mm -hmm. She really, really wanted to get married, not because she wanted to get married, but she wanted the money, you know, from, and she told her sister Nellie this. So Nellie actually said this later that Bella was more enthralled with the idea of what a husband could provide for her money wise than like actually having a relationship and a family. And, and this is a thing of the times. Yeah. 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 So okay. <clears throat> um, it was more like to her a business arrangement Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on some level. And she would actually, um, she would actually get married in uh, March of 1884. Uh, her first husband, uh, his name was Mads Ditlov Anton Sorensen. Uh, she was 24 at the time. Hmm. Uh, he was described as a very loving man uh, and a good father uh, later on. She would go on to tell Nellie that she only stayed with him simply because he got her a nice house. And that was just her, you know, uh, idea. So you kind of get where she's okay. at right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Right? Her <clears throat> ideals. Yeah where her motive is. Mm -hmm. And so began an instance of turmoil between the two sisters uh, that would ultimately lead to their separation. So uh, Bella, during the first year of her marriage with Mads, couldn't conceive a child. Uh, so her sister uh, had a four-year-old. Um, her name it was Olina, right? And, mm -hmm. and Bella was very, or I'm sorry, Olga. Bella was very uh, wrapped up. And she, she really wanted um, Olga to, like, she wanted to raise her and, and kind of have her as a child. And uh -huh. seeing as her sister already had, you know, other children and she couldn't have this child, it was a big deal to her. And she was very, like, you know, possessive over the daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what Nellie did was she said, you know what, maybe, like, she'll end up getting pregnant, whatever. I'll let her keep her for six weeks. It'll be like an extended visit, right? Right. But at the end of the six weeks... You know, when asked to give her back, she oh. was fighting her on the issue. So, huh? That got kind of rough, you know, and and was yeah. There was little conversation between them, um, from from what I've read 
uh, after that. And I mean, there, of course, she's testified later on and her sister and whatever. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty much the end of things. Uh, but in 1891, <clears throat> Bella would actually get her wish. Uh, a nearby neighbor, um, this is the Olson family, I believe was their names. Uh, the wife of the family uh, was sick and dying. Uh, this woman had just had a child. And Bella had begged her for the opportunity to take the baby in because, you know, she knew she was on her last leg. Yeah. Um, by this time, the baby was eight months old. Uh, her name was Jenny. Uh, and Bella swore to take care of her and raise her as her own. And after the woman died, uh, Bella frequently came by with the infant uh, just so the child's father uh, and husband, you know, to the deceased could spend time with young Jenny. Uh, years later... Uh, this man would eventually remarry, uh, and when he asked to reclaim custody of the now toddler, Jenny, uh, Bella refused, took him to court, and got full custody. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, With yeah. what intention? Well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of crazy intention, and it's, it's kind of easy to see, I think, and it's, it's really kind of stupid, because I look at this, and when I see it from the outside and I, you know, as I'm reading this story, I'm like, how can people be so stupid? No. <laughs> you know, and you're like <laughs> banging your head against the wall. Just like, why, why, why? Yeah. Uh, but it's, it was just a weird time, you know, things were different yeah. and, and yeah. It's hard to put yourself in the shoes of that time because we look at things so much different now. Yeah. 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 It's like, of course that, that's, that's what that means. And you know what? Forensics, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. So. That's why laws are here, people. Hmm. All right. So uh, Mats, Bella's husband, only brought home around $15 a week. Uh, he was a night watchman at a department store. And uh, we'll, we'll say like after inflation, that comes out to like 450 bucks a week. So they were living hmm. on like meager earnings, yeah. right? Minimum wage, basically. But this dude must have been a penny pincher because he managed to scrape together enough money to purchase a small uh, confection store. Uh, it was like a like, corner store. Like yeah. you could buy cigarettes to bat, like all yeah. kinds of stuff at that time. Um, it didn't do very well. Uh, Bella grew very impatient and upset uh, as she watched her beloved money dwindle. Mm. Coincidentally, less than a year after the purchase, a fire broke out in the store. Now it was noted by the insurance investigators that uh, even though Bella said at the time that it was caused by a lamp that had tipped over. And mm -hmm. uh, like they used to have these uh, gat like kerosene lamps, right? Right. Yeah. And uh, it started a fire in the store, and um, she, I mean, she, her and the toddler were the only ones there, so nobody could really, nobody knew. Yeah. Um. So they said there was no broken glass, indicating that it would be a fire started by a kerosene, like a broken lamp. I mean, there would be glass somewhere, would, and yeah. there wasn't. Yeah. So, um, she also knew exactly how much money. And insurance that she would be recouping from the loss of the place. Sounds so, pretty planned. Yeah, totally. Having recouped their investment, even though there was a ton of suspicion surrounding this, they actually did get the, the insurance payout. Um, they moved to a blue-collar suburb on the outskirts of Chicago called Austin. Now, they moved into a three-story bay-windowed house, a pretty decent living space for them. Uh, and over the next two years, this would become the home of four more children. Uh, between 1896 and 1898. Uh, still, we don't really know. At, at no point did I really read that anyone witnessed her have a child. So we're not sure she ba bared children. Yeah. We, we don't know if she They she have could, more yeah. children. We're not sure. And we don't know how she came about huh. having these children. Interesting. Um, so, yeah. Now, two of the four children died. Uh, one from inflammation of the intestines and one from something called hydrocephalus, uh, but it's more commonly known as water on the brain. Uh, this was a three-month-old boy named Axel and a five-month-old girl named Caroline. So there's three children left total now, hmm. uh, Jenny and the other two. <clears throat> now, one thing that should be understood about the time, uh, because of the medical resources and knowledge were limited, uh, there was a staggering amount of deaths in newborn babies, probably every hundred uh, deaths out of a thousand, there was probably a hundred deaths out of every thousand live births. Uh, so because of that fact, there really, there really wasn't a lot of evidence to support an intense investigation into the type of thing. So yeah, yeah we just kind of got to assume that maybe she didn't do what I think she did. <laughs> <laughs> now on October 1st, 1897, 
The family was visited by a man. Um, his name was Angus. Uh, he proclaimed himself to be an agent and engineer for the Yukon Mining and Trading Company. Um, and he, you know, kind of flaunted this, this whole situation. It's like, oh, buy stock in our mining company and we'll send you to Alaska. And, and you know, we, like we own, we own mines in uh, New Mexico and, you know, all over the place, right? So they kind of bought, you know, the bait and they invested. They actually took a loan out on their house, invested $700 uh, that today would roughly be the equivalent of $20,000, putting, putting that lien on their house to secure the funds to do so. Uh, now, Bella's sister being an extremely limited acquaintance in their life at this point would later say that she was excited to send Mots away for the year, being that she was really only interested in him for his ability to bring her money. Mm. So now they both found out later the Yukon Mining Company was a scam. Uh-huh. They lost their money. Right. Um, and Mott's had to go back to his job as the Snake night watchman at a department store, right? Yeah. Bella was not too excited about being a housewife to a man that barely made any money. Yeah. Um, once again. She had higher aspirations. Absolutely. <laughs> and on the evening of April 10th, 1900, fire broke out in the family's home. Apparently, the fire was started by a defective heating apparatus. Um, once again, Bella knew exactly how much in, you I'm know. starting to see a pattern. Yeah, exactly. An interior <laughs> and whatever. Um, so they got, they got uh, a settlement again for their loss. Now, also at the time of the fire, Mott's belonged to a mutual benefits association under which he was covered up to $2,000 in life insurance. And that was about to expire on July 30th. And, and he had decided to let that policy lapse and insured himself for $3,000 um, on that date. Hmm. So a new policy set to begin on that same day. You can probably kind of guess that mm-hmm. on the afternoon of July 30th, 1900, Bell had urgently summoned the family, summoned, summoned, summoned the family doctor to their home. And when he arrived, he found Mott's fully clothed and unresponsive in his bed. Wow. Yeah. So both these doctors, there was another doctor that arrived and uh, they had some questions, mm-hmm. of course. Um, and it, it's just really kind of weird. And she does this a lot, of course. And just people just buy her story, you know. But it it, get, it gets intense later on. But was right she now, a looker? Yeah. I can't picture her. She was not a looker, man. So she just had some words. She, you know, like. She and, could talk. And maybe her... she, you know, she, she had something about her when she was younger. I mean, if you look pictures, and I'll, I'll like definitely post these uh, up so people can see them or links yeah. to the photos. Uh, but. Yes, there was something. She was a, a rather large, like even in stature. Like okay. She was like, you know, stocky lady. A stocky lady and, and very like, she was built like a man, hmm. you know, from all accounts. So she had some kind of influence. Yeah, she definitely, I think there was something about it, it's And it's weird too because she always attracts these really kind gentlemen or even handsome gentlemen hmm. that are just like, whoa. Okay. People like were like, whoa, like, how, how did, how's that even, how's that happening right now? Yeah. She's a horrible person. Her her attitude is like crap. Yeah, everything about her screams like get away from me. Still gets the guy that she needs to uh, take advantage of to excel to whatever her next priority is. Hmm. <laughs> so she gave them some BS excuse about um, he came home with a fearful headache, and uh, I told him to go lay down, and you know I I'd, I'd give him some medicine, and at the time it was quinine powder uh, to kind of like help with headaches and you know sinuses and colds and whatnot. And these would come from the pharmacy in these little, like, paper sacks, right? Mm -hmm. But so did morphine and other lethal drugs at the time. So the doctors are like, oh, well, did you know what was in the packet that you gave them? And she's like, no. And they're like, do you have the packet? And she's like, oh, I threw it out. And nobody really bothered to dig through the trash. Or, I mean, I don't even know. So Convenient. Yeah. So we can all assume that she probably poisoned him because she recouped both of the payouts, the $2,000 that was ending and another $3,000 that was, mm-hmm. you know, coming that day. So yeah. both of them were active at the wow. same time. Um, so you can only guess like, all right. And, and by today's standards, that's about 150,000. Mm. So that's wow. Yeah. She, that's this criminally crazy amount of money. <laughs> that, yeah. Like I would draw some attention right now. I feel mm. like, yeah. Uh, now three days later, Matt's Ditlow Anton Storensen was laid to rest next to his two infant children that also died under questionable circumstances. Now, in attendance of the funeral, 
Bella's estranged sister, Nellie, would later testify that she had an extremely dark and foreboding premonition that something bad was about to happen. But she wouldn't really know till about eight years later. Hmm. Uh, she just felt, and she described this vision that she had, and it was just, it was, it was horrible. It was really racking her brain. Like, it, it, she just felt bad. Um, so, uh, Bella would take this money and use it to move to a farmstead in LaPorte, Indiana. Now, this farmstead had a very spotty past, to put it lightly. Uh, it was the home of the leader of a local outlaw gang at one point that used to, quote unquote, terrorize the area uh, until they became so wanted that most of them left. Uh, the leader and son of the property owner died in a shootout in Montana, like completely reckless people. <laughs> it's funny, funny in these times, too, how you can just uh, jump around yeah. and, and lose yeah, I mean, there's whole, status. there's a whole section, too. And if you read the, some of these books that I I did the research in where, like, dudes just, like, did some horrible things and killed people. And then, like, they moved to, like, Texas go, go, yeah, and go started to the, a new life. Go to the next town. You're good to go. Oh, Nobody yeah. knows who yeah. you are and they're not going to be able to follow like, you. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, good. I'm not a mass murderer. My name's John now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And she did. She she changed her name, too. So, initially, her name was, like, uh, Bryn Hill Paul's daughter Storseth, right? Hmm. So she changed that to Bella Peterson when mm. she moved to America. Yep. Uh, and then you'll see later on, she changes it again, of course. Uh, makes sense. So, yeah. so she's just jumping around. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the main thing that I, I wanted to talk about this farm and, and where it kind of became the size that it was, uh, it became a uh, brothel. Ah. And it was run by a very, I don't know, she was a city slicker. Like she, you know, and she was, she was a bad mama. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she ran the place and, and she only, it was quoted as like the nicest place for that kind of activity huh. in the area. Um, it, she, the bedrooms were all expanded and whatever. There was a bar, there was all kinds of stuff. Place there. To so, go. Yeah, it was definitely the spot to be. Um, she died shortly after under mysterious circumstances. Uh, two brothers moved in, uh, died suddenly. No one knows how or why. Hmm. Uh, later after that, it was transferred to a farmer who hung himself in a bedroom in the second floor. So like, it's wow. just, yeah, it's something's going on. Yeah. And then eight years after all that, Bella moves in. Ah. And, uh, so during Bella's marriage to Mads, they took in a boarder by the name of Peter Ganess. Peter had since married a woman in Minneapolis who had two children. Peter's wife, unfortunately, died while giving birth to their second child. Uh, the oldest child's name was Swan Hill. So, mental check mark that, because yeah. it's important for later. Yeah. Uh, Bella decided while visiting family in Minnesota that she would reacquaint herself with Peter, who by all accounts was a pretty handsome dude at the time. Uh, Bella, however, was no peach. Time had taken its toll on her, and she wasn't really that great to begin with. Uh, but a lot of people like I've, I've heard some pretty, like I busted out laughing and I say this because like just the descriptions, like uh, how, how could somebody be so crass, you know? Mm, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was just hilarious. Like some of the descriptions of her, but <laughs> uh, you see how it all plays into it. And, and she ends up being like inside just what she is on the outside, you know? Uh -huh. So it, it, it works. <laughs> it yep. works for her. Uh, so she went back to Minnesota. She had uh, cousins or something like that in Minnesota. And she um, found uh, Peter again and, you know, told him about her land. She's got like 48 acres on this farmstead and, and all this stuff. And they're buttering him up. Exactly. Yeah. So she's like, let's merge our, you know, money and like move in with me and whatever. And mm -hmm. so he agreed. They move in. Um, they get married. Uh, this is in April of 1902. Uh, five days later. Peter's youngest daughter died under the care of Bella. So like, man. Yeah. And it was, it was some sort of like lung, uh, lung issue, really kind of unknown, uh, lung, uh, asphyxiation, but not asphy asphyxiation. Like she got suffocated, but it could have been, but like there was, could have been maybe yeah. poison induced, maybe could have been, you know, hmm. uh, eight months later, Peter Ganess would also die in an unfortunate accident involving a meat grinder. Oof. <laughs> That's rough. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when the town doctor and coroner, uh, he was acting coroner at, at the time, he arrived at the scene, uh, he observed the back of Peter's head had an awful wound caked with blood. His nose was sharply broken to one side. Uh, the coroner's first impression was that he had been murdered. 
And this guy goes on to like pursue, like he, this is his, like, he's like, no, nah, this guy was killed for sure. Yeah. Um, s- some weird things that happened that just things that I remember from the reading uh, is when all this went down, Bella had sent her daughter, Jenny, uh, the first uh, mm-hmm. adopted child, sent her to the neighbor's house. They were called the Nicholsons. Uh, she sent them down and she had like a iron poker or something in her hand. And they were rapping. The, the neighbors were like, oh, it's there. we heard this rapping at the door. And then <laughs> these people are funny, too, because they're the way they talk is like very like. Old West uneducated. OK, so the way they describe things is, is, is a little funny, but. The guy goes to the house and he finds Bella in the kitchen and she's like a sobbing, dramatic, emotional wreck. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, Peter's laying on the floor in front of the stove. And there's a pool of blood. Uh, he goes to check his pulse, and he said, uh, "He don't say nothing, you know. He don't say nothing. He He's don't. Dead. He don't say nothing. The guy's dead, right? Yep. Uh, now Bella was questioned about the incident. Um, she claims that uh, he walked down to get his shoes, uh, which he kept uh, down next to the stove to keep them warm. That makes a little sense for the time." When he did so, a large meat grinder fell from the top shelf. Uh, she used this as her drying rack. Hmm. Uh, apparently hitting the back of his head and smashing his face on either the stove or a putting block, a butcher block next to that. Now this, in the meantime, spilled the bowl of like hot salt water on his neck too. Jesus. Uh, the postmortem uh, was reported that there was no burns on the body consistent with scalding. Uh, his nose was lacerated, which it would indicate that he did indeed smash it on something, or it could have been he could have been hit repeatedly with an object um, to cause that type yeah. of injury to happen. Ouch! Uh, the back of his head was hit with such force that it fractured his skull all the way through and caused a brain hemorrhage, which, which would ultimately be ruled as the cause of death. Um, Bella again was questioned in the presence of a jury, um, although her story didn't add up. And it didn't stop with her. Um, Her daughter, Jenny, obviously was coached. Uh, They questioned her separately and her story lined up so well with Bella's story that it was, yeah, it was just like, come on, dude. You know? Yeah. She was told what to say. (laughs) Absolutely, bro. Um, Jesus. I just, I just think it's really. I'm surprised that, I mean, I, I can't imagine in these times, I just can't like. Somebody who has this much history with this type of yeah. stuff. And you could tell that you could tell the the yeah, the doctor even knew about the previous situation. So what he did too was he also questioned Jenny about <clears throat> uh Bella's previous husband. Yeah. And Jenny apparently exploded with all this info, like, oh, like she knew exactly what had happened that day. But her her story about how Mads died didn't match what Bella had told uh investigators at the end. Uh She said that her mother went upstairs and she heard screaming in the room that, and Uh then she don't, she doesn't remember her mom coming out, Bella coming out. Uh, but she just knows the next thing that happened was the the medical team came and, and, you know, whatever found the, the doctors came and found him, uh, dead. So. Yeah. There's, there's a lot on the table. Yeah. It's, it's just a weird. He started adding it up and. Somebody's got to figure this out at some point. It and the funny thing is, is you would think so. You, know? you would think. And a lot of people are starting to draw uh, an eye to her. Um, just very suspicious of her. Mm-hmm. Um, however, given the story that Jenny gave uh, for that instance, and there was really no conclusive evidence that she talked about besides the scream of the previous murder, there was no way to, you know. Put her in, and also the neighbors, the Nicholsons. Which this is really important later. Uh, but the man, when he went to court and testified, he said initially that oh, he didn't really know how their relationship was. Like he he's only been there once, and uh, but when he was in court and he was testifying, he said, um, "Oh, they were running around like lovebirds, uh, like they had just been married every day," which makes them seem really well. Yeah, it's like, also an off the cuff comment. Yeah. Like and I mean, it just, it like I mean, if, I, if, if I'm nowhere. just spe- if I'm just speaking about somebody, I don't necessarily yeah, be like, care you, you too much about. You live across town, and I'm like, I know all about your relationship. I really don't. No, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no. Oh, if I've met, if I've met and seen you two together, I'm gonna be like, yeah, they seem yeah, great. They seem like a really great couple. Yeah, sure. I don't give a shit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I really don't. Honey, what are you doing? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, and especially at the time, it's like everything was so gossip driven. Yeah. Like the town gossip. So things were getting hot. There was a lot of murders at the time. Like there was one story I heard that uh, a girl got sent some, um, just people were doing weird stuff. Like this girl got uh, delivered some candies and she ate the candies thinking everything was all fine. Well, they were laced with arsenic and she died. Oh, Nobody wow. found out who did that. Um, you know, some other people got murdered and, you know, the people responsible ran off. They couldn't find them. You know, like it's just, it was at that time, it was like a lot of murders were happening. So they were like, oh, this is definitely all part of that. So part of them were like, oh, well, what if someone broke in and killed him? But she, she kept claiming, no, no, nobody broke in. I was with him. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't see it happen, but I saw the after effects and they're like, well, he's got this huge gash and smashed piece of his back. You didn't tell him that his head was cut? Oh, no. She said, he, he, you know, I noticed there was a little cut. Oh, well, was it bleeding? Because it was like ridiculous, the amount of blood. Right. And she's like, oh, no, 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 it was fine. Hmm. So she claims that she, you know, put a, a warm cloth on him. And it's such it's a just, weird time. Yeah, like, yeah. it's just it, hard to know. just bought it, dude. Yeah. Well, and I mean, it's hard to know at those times. It's, yeah. I can't imagine. With everything we go through here uh, now, like, and the way they go about assessing a situation. Yeah. Can you imagine 120 years ago or so? It's so crazy. Trying to figure out who did what and why. Who done it? It'd be like a who done. It'd be like Clue, except worse. <laughs> yeah. And there's, and sometimes there's not a reason, like you said, with the uh, candy or whatever it was. Yeah, like who would do something just, like that? Yeah, but there's always that person. There's that, yeah. There's that asshole out there that's just, I gotta, I gotta Mi- fuck with somebody's day. Mr. Crabtree. Yeah. Just cooking up arsenic laced uh, so, puff tarts. I just gotta fuck with somebody's day. Yeah. Let me, let me just kill somebody. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Good. No I mean, biggie. it's not like they're gonna catch me. Yeah. I just send these off. Maybe it lands in the right hand. Maybe it lands in a naughty person's hands. Maybe not. Maybe not. Jesus. Wow. People, man. Mm-hmm. Well, she's one of these people. And uh, hmm. every in a town, everybody in the town was starting to get that. Uh, Sounds like it. They knew the whole thing reeked of murder. It was eventually ruled as an accident regardless. Hmm. Uh, and it was ruled like on his burial day. Uh, and there's other parts of this too where like, there were one of the Nicholson's little kid, uh, when he left the house, he was like, Oh man, she murdered, she, mur- she murdered him. She, right. She done and did the him. dad was like, no, don't say no. Miss, you know, miss, miss Ganes could get in trouble, you know? And mm, so like, shucks. pa told me to shut up, you know, like that was how it was, you know? Uh-huh. But this same kid was at the funeral and he said later that he had noticed when she was sobbing and making a big scene at his, his burial, uh, that that she had noticed that she put her hands in front of her eyes and there were no tears, but she was looking to see everyone's reaction. Oh, bad move. Yeah, like she was trying to see like what kind of huh. <laughs> what kind of she, audience you reaction. Go, you gotta go all in. What is wrong with you? Yeah, hey. like you you, <laughs> you got an Academy Award. Yeah, that man. Shit. Like you got. We need to see some some. We need to see the wet works. If you're not going to have wet works, you better keep your eyes covered. Exactly. Don't be looking through fingers. Nobody wants to see you looking at them, wondering what they're thinking of you. <laughs> that's a that's an obvious tell. My daughter does that. That's a sociopathic play or, yeah. or a child's play. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's like everybody is buying this right now, but I just want to see how they look. Yeah. Like, how do they see me? Yeah. I kind of want to see how this is affecting people. Yeah. That's like a narcissistic sociopathic kind Oof. of thing. So this is really funny too. Well, not fun. No, this is funny, but it's just funny how it all comes to, you know, whatever. Uh, a week after, just a week after Peter was buried, uh, Myrtle, this is one of Bella's previous three surviving children. Uh, she would whisper to a schoolmate of hers, my mommy killed my daddy. She hit him with a meat cleaver in the back of the head. Don't tell anybody. I was really hoping that was going to be a rhyme. Right? I think there is a rhyme about that's here. pretty. That's that's pretty dope. That, uh, well, not dope, but we, we, so, okay. So where does this come from? So all of a sudden, she just starts telling people, but like, don't tell anybody. 
Well, she, I mean, probably she's a little kid. She's got to get it off her chest. She probably knows what happened, saw what happened. But Bella's mm. crazy, man. Yeah. She, she would have killed she's any got, one of them kids. And she's got to be scared of mommy. Yeah. Mommy's a scary individual. Oof. So very shortly thereafter, too, um, Bella welcomed a baby, a baby boy to the fold. Poor kid. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, nobody witnessed the birth of the baby, but the midwife was called to the house, right? And this is how she described it. She said that <coughs> Bella was already up. The baby was washed clean and, and clothed, fully clothed. Yeah. Um, Bella was walking around and like, like she was like, ma'am, you got to go to bed. Like you got to like, like, and she's like, nope, in the old country, we don't go to bed after have baby. Oh, okay. She's, she either just pops him out. <laughs> She either just dropped a baby like a deuce, uh, or like I don't know what happened, but it, it let it I, roll I, itself I, yeah, to bed. I I'm gonna guess, and I haven't read it yet to find out if like they actually did find this out, but we will find out through this. I'm gonna guess she murdered somebody and just stole their baby. Oh, wow! I think that'd be a fine, educated guess to make, just based on the way this is going. Yeah. It's I mean, it sounds about right, the way she's acting. <laughs> it's, t- it's leaning in that direction. Jiminy. Jiminy crickets. Cripes <laughs> all Friday. All right. So, yeah, Belle was witness watching her and chasing her pigs around. Oh. Right after this supposed birth. You got to love it. So <laughs> She's got nobody looking at her vagina. Nobody. See Nobody's what's like, on? yo, what's going on up there? He's just popping out. Just throwing kids just down. Just throwing them out. Cannonball. Like just, yeah. Cannonball. Wing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Jesus. It's ridiculous, man. Uh, a lot of her neighbors and town folk immediately thought that she adopted the baby or procured him through some other sinister means. I'd Ooh. have to agree. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And there's Peter's brother, Gus. Oh. I'm going to say his name is Gus. Someone said Gus, whatever. We're going to call him Gus. Ooh, but go. you know what I, what I mean when I say Gus? It's Peter's brother. Uh, He came down from Minnesota to inquire about some things, already extremely suspicious of the circumstances surrounding his brother's death. Uh, He was starting to wonder how Swan Hild, Peter's last living child, was doing under the care of Bella, her stepmother. Uh, And more importantly, Gus was curious as to where $2,500 in life insurance Peter had left to her was. Mm. Now, Bella said that right before Peter died, he had turned that insurance payout into a uh a stock right in a mining company at that oh oh. (laughs) so like she's just like taking her 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 old life's mishappenings and creating lies out of them it's like crazy yeah so gus asked obviously he's like where the receipts let me see let me see the bond receipts like let me see it and Mm. she couldn't she couldn't produce them but instead she offered her assurances and stated that he could stay with her in Swan Hill at the farm. Oh, and let me at feed her, you something at her murder farm. Yeah, let me uh, let me make you some dinner. Let me feed you. It. Let me. You know what? Not not let me feed you. Let me feed you to my pigs. Yeah, what the fuck? Crazy. So, for once in this story, I got to give it up to Gus because he said hell no, right? At a boy. Yeah, right. At a boy, Gus. Over the course of the next few days, he managed to leave unnoticed and took Swan Hill with him. Good call. That's a good call. Good call. Now, there's a few accounts after this about her just having a complete fallout with all of her neighbors. One of those neighbors being the Nicholsons. She was a bad chick. Yep. So some of her cattle would, you know, because she was just manning the farm figuratively and literally by herself. Mm. And, uh, you know, people talked about this lady like she was like a, like, she was like a beast. Yeah. She was like a beast, like a quarter, like a, no, like a, like a linebacker. She's like a linebacker. Yeah. So she's running the farm, you know, like she's got all this, all this stuff going on. She's like, you know, doing all the, uh, planting and all the, you know, crop stuff and all that. And it like toy, uh, what do they call that? Turning the, turning over the, the dirt. I don't even know what's good. You guys know what I'm talking about. Up? Uh, yeah. Who cares? Uh, so a lot of her cattle would end up roaming onto other people's property. So mm-hmm. they're like eating their corn. And shit like that. So they're like, all right, well, this is costing me money. Otherwise, uh-huh. I wouldn't care. So the Nicholsons were like, yo, like, you do that again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your cattle and you're going to have to pay me a dollar to get them back. 
So what happened? She let him go. Mm. They took her cattle and she came to get him. And the dude was like, you got to pay me a dollar. So Mr. Nicholson's cattle was roaming in the street. A couple days later, she took his cattle in. And when he came over, she was like, you got to pay me a dollar. Mm. And he's like, I'm not paying you a dollar. Give me my cattle back. And he started going to the gate and opening the gate. And like he was going to take the cattle out. And uh, Bella was like, don't touch that gate. And she pointed at her daughter and said, go get the gun. Wow. So Jenny ran up to the house, got the gun. She pointed it at him and said, get out of here or pay me the dollar. And he paid her the dollar. Wow. That was the end of that relationship. Yeah. So um, also more cattle issues. Pigs had roamed onto other people's property. Same thing, man. Like mm-hmm. she was claiming that other neighbors were after her money and all this other crazy stuff because it's all she cared about. Uh, now, though she was handling the farm on her own because she was constantly described as that capable of a woman, mm-hmm. uh, somebody said, there's another, I just got to throw this in there. Uh, she would go to like pig auctions or, or uh, it's basically a fair for uh, yeah, livestock for, sales. Yeah, like livestock auctions, right? Yeah. And, uh, she would buy pigs and, and she'd pick up like a 200 pound pig and just toss it up in her carriage. Like nothing. Ooh. Like it was a bag. of. Oh, laundry. she was a burly woman. She was, she was ready to go. <laughs> so eventually, even though all of this was going on and she was working it, she needed a man. And especially in the winter time, she needed help. So she, uh, in February of that year, a Norwegian immigrant by the name of Olaf Lindboy responded to an ad for a laborer on a farm in Laporte, Indiana. He packed up all his things, including his life savings of $600, and headed to Bella's farm. Um, she wasted no time, somehow, once again, to lure this man to be attracted to her and her huge tracts of land. Mm. So they say. He even wrote to his family saying that he may be getting married soon and enjoyed the position of being manager of the farm. I mean, he said master, but I, I mm. can't even say that he was uh, in that position. Huh. Shortly after that, she asked a local man, Chris Christofferson, no relation. Every time I hear this name, though, I think of Chris. Of course. And, and like this, you're going to think every time I talk about him, you're going to be like, that's Chris Christofferson right there walking up. So she asked uh, Christofferson to help her with a task on the property because her hired hand, Olaf, had suddenly left. Now, when Chris asked where Olaf had gone to, she said he went to the World's Fair and claimed he was going to buy some land in that area. Uh, Another neighbor, one of the Nicholsons, recounted a different story, however, stating that Bella told her that he left back to Norway to see the new king be crowned. Olaf's family, however, in Norway, wrote her asking what happened to him. Yeah. Because they haven't seen him. Wondering where that's going. And she replied, he went west and took up a homestead there. Three different stories. Yeah. Three different people. She's just not even consistent with her stories. Everybody's like, oh, okay. Yeah, interesting. I guess we're, okay, we can't sail to America. And... So I wonder what happened to Olaf. Um, he was one of the people that was identified later. Yeah. Yeah. Now, those 40, they don't know because the bones of some of them were smashed up, crunched up, uh, some of the bodies had been eaten by pigs. Um, Too decimated to tell. Yeah, but they were able to identify certain bodies as certain people uh, at a certain point. So uh, Olaf, I think, was one of the people that was identified. Mm. So, yeah, he would stay on the farm forever. Yeah. Uh, a couple months later, in uh, 1905, Christofferson was at the Guinness Farm, Guinness Farm, when a stranger arrived from the town with a heavy trunk. Uh, this guy's name was Henry Gerhold. He was there to work for Bell. Christofferson helped him carry uh, this huge case that he had full of his stuff up to the room that was previously occupied by Olaf. Now, Henry would write to his mother like a week later and describe the farm as one of the nicest houses in the neighborhood, remarking on the wonderful accommodations that he was being treated almost as one of the family. Little did he know that that was a bad thing. Mm. Christofferson would see <laughs> Bell and Henry around the farm working over the next few weeks. Uh, he said they almost had a, a, a friendship that was so close that he would even say that, you know, they might be like fiance 
type stuff going on, whatever. So she had also, once again, snared somebody into this. Mm -hmm. Um, All of a sudden, in August of 1905, Bella needed Chris's help again, stating that Henry had suddenly quit, that he was sick and couldn't do the work, also that he had conveniently left most of his belongings, including a fur coat behind when he apparently departed for Chicago. Uh, When Christofferson saw her wearing the coat uh, around walking around her property, uh, he asked if Henry had written her uh, for that coat. Because, I mean, he went to Chicago. It's cold and shit. Like, why would yeah. you leave that for a coat? Right. Uh, she told him that she hadn't heard a word. Hmm. So. She seems a little cav- cavalier with uh, just, just. She's just like, I'm killing people now. I'm just throwing it down. And I don't even care what people think. And she, you know what it sounds like? is She's getting a little uh, used to getting away with it. Oh, yeah. And so she's finding that it's, it's quickly becoming easier to do. Yeah. And she's now found a method. To get rid of the bodies. Uh-huh. Oh, well, pigs. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, and, eat and the shit. She's ruthless, man. Like, she used to, they also just said, like, she would, like, when the when those 200-pound hogs, when it tam- came time to butcher them, she would do the whole thing herself, cut the head off, butcher them, gut them. Makes sense, too, though, because if you're going to do it, if there's any remains left in it, you want to be the one to do it so somebody else isn't finding it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, dude. So... I think she's a really twisted person. Uh-huh. Um, this is probably going to be a three-parter. Yep. Um, I'm going to leave it off right here. There's yeah. a lot more that happens, um, and I really want to focus, I think, that the last episode on the just how they dug up her property and the things they found and just oh, the I grotesque manner that, yeah, that, that things happen. Um. And we'll we'll just leave the next episode for there's a whole span of still more building. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens. There's quite a bit though. I mean, just to break it, to unpack a little bit of that. I mean, she just she like she started off. It almost seemed accidental. Maybe uh, this happens, and then she started to get a taste for it. Started realizing how easy it was. Yeah, and just kind of uh, trying to trying to up her social status through. Uh, yeah, and she working kept, through people. She kept, and now it's not even at the point where it's like, oh, these people had this guy. I believe Henry. It was found out later that men were starting to bring money, and you'll find out later too that she also started to make packs with men, like here, come and and join me on my farm, but bring your fortune with you. Yeah, yeah. So she wasn't even doing insurance fraud at that point anymore. It was it was more of like she was know, just she's prepping it. She's right. She's completely just. She knew what she was doing. She, yeah, she was a total she brain seems fixer. Pretty rotten. I mean. I mean, smart for the her idea, time, pretty rotten. Yeah, and the idea at that time, though, too, is that she had this huge piece of land that apparently to a lot of people were like, this like, this is money. That was a thing. Especially yeah. to an immigrant, and she was just dragging these people in. Like, she was posting all of her, her ads on, like, an English, uh, Dutch kind of like, or not Dutch, but, like, Norwegian, uh, sw- Swedish uh, newspaper. So it was, like, in both languages and uh-huh. printed out in all these cities in the Midwest. So these people would see these these immigrants freshly come there with this money and right and I mean they're they're, they're already going. they're already coming with the idea of I need to find a way to make a way yeah and then when you see that it almost seems too good to be true and so they're gonna they're gonna back burner this is this uh is it safe they're gonna they're gonna put that on the back of the stove because. Because they wanna, they wanna make a life for themselves. They wanted the American dream yeah. deal. And, so that uh, whole feeling, like being timid about anything, is is like really you just can't. You got to go for it. Right. And a lot of these dudes were just like, yeah, fuck my feelings, dude. And in this time, though, you know, you you link up with one of these crazy people that, yeah, they're gonna. No one's ever gonna find you. Yeah. You know, and that's what happens. And uh, really insane. Anyways, thanks guys for listening. Uh, this this is our first one, and, and there's gonna be many more to come. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, definitely. Um, I am Lucas Brand signing out. John Nine. You've been listening to Mister Murder Fix, a Lucas Brand and John Nine production. Don't forget to join us on social media and come back next week for your next fix. Thanks again.
So this I is. I gotta find another spot for that because that's gonna happen. But <laughs> it's all good. I mean, we're gonna be stuff like know. that though. Is like it's natural. That's yeah. gonna happen so, during yeah. the cast. But yeah, if and we're then chatting, this is like if I'm really facing the like, mic hey, and I'm listen, trying to talk into you. I gotta tell you something. Oh. <laughs> what are you trying to tell me right now? Listen, I gotta fucking tell you something right now. What are you trying to listen? <laughs> what are you trying to fucking tell But that's me? what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> See, no, all right, that's pretty good. Yeah. How do you feel about those wave files? I feel like they look good. Like you, you, you know, can work as long as out. yeah, as, as long as we're not peeking, dude. Like it's fine yeah. to be completely honest. Yeah. And then, I could probably. Damn it, if I fucking want to say something. Like that. All right. <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> all right. This is totally going at the end of the episode. Yeah. Keep it. No, <laughs>